Base has dropped on Soccer's Morning Show, and we got uh, quoting Jerry Reed in Smokey and the Bandit. We got a long way to go in a short time to get there. We'll be northbound a little bit. We'll be midwestbound a little bit. We're going to get you ready for the weekend. We're going to be talking about a lot of different things. We got Weekend Whip Around. We got 930. We got uh, Commissioner uh, John Pruch of Nisa coming on at 10 o'clock. But we are catching up with the busiest man in futsal. And I'm not kidding when I say this. He's in the green room, and I can actually see him smiling. And we're, ta- we're trying to make sure that it's safe driving while he's going on and doing these kinds of things. Safe interviewing. We believe in that here at SDH. So without wasting any time, opening kickoff, brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. That's your QR code. For those of you watching on Twitch, don't forget, you go to Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. What you do, you use the code soccer down here 15. You get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10% reinvest it in youth games, youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Time to take a breath. And now that means that we bring in from the green room, we go to Utica, New York, and we catch up with the man who is in charge of the U.S. men's futsal national team, Everton Moreira. Coach, thanks for coming on with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I love I love talking about soccer. I love talking about futsal. I love talking about football in general. Uh, thank you very much for having me in the morning show. All right. So the reason that we have you on is uh, it's an education for our, our listeners and our, and our viewers, but it is also because you are getting your passport stamped and probably another 15 or so folks in two days' time as the U.S. men's futsal national team is going to the CONCACAF Futsal Championships in Nicaragua. First and foremost, congrats. I know this is what the anticipated path is. How are you feeling going into Nicaragua? Uh, I, I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, I'm very confident. Uh, we, we've been doing uh, um, – we had three camps with the players, with the team, and every camp we can see them uh, progressively improved. Uh, offensively, defensively. Uh, our main goal first was to identify a core of players uh, to deal with us. And I think that was very, very quick for us to, to identify the core. Uh, the last uh, camp that we had in, in Argentina, we had uh, three games in there. And the games were, it was good, uh, even better than, than what we expected, uh, the way how we compete. So I'm very, I'm very confident on this team, and I really believe uh, uh, this group that we're gonna gonna get our job done. When it comes to getting a group together to make sure that you can accomplish the goals that you're chasing, what were you looking for in these individuals, other than the idea that they have played together before? There might be some continuity. There might be some likeness and thought when it comes to okay i know what you want me to do when i do this and this and this what were you looking for in those individuals that you're taking with you to nicaragua uh we um we have a, a interesting uh, uh group part of the players uh play for masl the major arena soccer league in the united states and you know they're professional they, they they're used to to being professional, they used to uh, 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 a lot of people watching them with pressure, but it's still a different sport. It's still, it's still arena soccer, and we have few players that play uh, first division and second division in Italy, uh, futsal, which obviously they also are familiar to to the game, but they also are professional, and we have uh, other players. They're very, very good soccer players. And they're very good futsal players, but they're not necessarily right now playing uh, professional in the United States. So it's, it's, a, it's a big mix. So what I was trying to do, what I tried to do at my first uh, uh, camp is to get, uh, I, I couldn't reinvent the wheel. Uh, the, the, the last, the last uh, cycle that they had, they, they finished the cycle with a group of players, with the core. I, all I could do is to continue to have some of that play that, you know, those players and infuse and implement some players that I believe that would do well for us and end up mashing really well, surprisingly well at, at first try. That's, that's, that normally doesn't happen that easy, uh, but it matched really well. So I was fortunate for that to happen. And I, I was just looking for players that one, understand that going to CONCACAF we're going to be playing against national t- 
teams that have uh, uh, professional programs in their country of futsal, so they're more familiar with playing futsal. So you have to understand that sometimes you're going to get stuck defensively, so you have to defend well. Uh, and we have to have fast. Hello? Yep, you're with me. You're good. Sorry. Uh, and, and we're going to have to have uh, fast transitions uh, going forward. We have to understand uh, that sometimes we're going to have to learn uh, how to how to suffer defensively. So I was looking for, for a group of players that can be strong offensively, defensively, technical ability, but also mentally, because the mental game is going to be extremely important in that competition. You became head coach last September. What has this experience been like for you to represent the United States in international competition? And what have you learned about yourself as a person and as a coach with this experience? Uh, first of all, it's, a, it's an honor. It's a, it's, a, it's a privilege for me to be, to be, you know, being part of the national team, to be, to be representing the United States. So it's an honor for me just, just to be that. I learned a few things about myself. I learned that uh, I actually can't multitask. I, <laughs> I, I wasn't quite, quite sure about that prior to it. Uh, I, I learned that I have to be always uh, very organized with my agenda, uh, but it, it gives me an extra experience. Or because you know, like I said, I, I my my full time job uh, it's right here with uh, Utica City FC in New York. But you know, being with the national team with futsal, they are, the U.S. Soccer Federation. They are so professional that helps me to become to learn more, to become even more professional towards to my full-time job here and, and vice versa. You know, like it helps me with the, with the, with my job in Utica CFC. It helps me to bring a little bit of experience my, with my, my coaching style all year round and my indoor soccer as well, the way how I, how I see the game. So uh, right now I can say, I can say that both sports, both, both sports are complementing each other and help me to just, uh, to become a better a better coach, you know, I, I always say that to my players, and my my job in the national team or in my or in my club is not to become the best coach in the world. I, I'm not here for that. Uh, I'm trying to to accomplish objectives. I'm trying to accomplish goals, and my goal right now is to focus on uh, qualifying to the to the World Cup, and and you know, like it's been 20 years since the United States have won Concacaf, so obviously. My my second objective is to is to win the World Cup to, to win the 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 Concacaf the the, the qualifiers and, and bring back the trophy that has not been in the United States for the past twenty years. Everton Moreira, head coach of the U.S. Men's Football National Team, they're getting ready for the Concacaf Championships. He's flying out this weekend. He's going to Nicaragua. That's why he's catching up with us from Utica, New York, going under underpasses on freeways and doing safe <laughs> interviewing here this morning on the morning show. When it comes to CONCACAF and futsal as a sport, how tough is it for the United States to navigate CONCACAF as, you know, as a futsal competition? How tough is futsal in CONCACAF? It, it, it is tough. There is a couple good national teams in there. You know, uh, Costa Rica is the most active uh, group in there the Costa Rica is the most active they they you know they have the, a professional program in there a lot of players play in Europe as well uh, Guatemala they have they have uh, a, a good national team that is a that's a you know they have like a big history with uh, with CONCACAF uh, Panama as well uh, you know Canada in the past had had some some success it's a, it's a tough competition uh, you know it, like I said before it's always it's always uh, tough when you go uh, from uh, uh, between sports, you know, like we don't we don't have a, a a full team right now that plays that plays futsal, but we do have uh, amazing players, amazing individuals. So our goal is just to make sure that they gel together and play very well as a group. But it's a tough competition. But I know that we've been doing a great job, and we're going to be a tough competitors as well. How difficult a transition is it for an arena soccer player? to grasp the differences in futsal and succeed in futsal? How different is it? 
it, it, it is a small size game, which that helps definitely, you know, uh, to play both games. I always say in arena soccer that it's easier uh, for a futsal player to adapt to play arena soccer than an outdoor soccer player to adapt to play arena soccer because the, the, the size of the game, because how quick, how fast uh, the arena soccer it's played as well. But I am very fortunate that those players that play arena soccer, they are coming with us to the national team. They are former futsal players as well. So that they absolutely help. Uh, all the players that play arena soccer that come to the national team, at some point, they also played futsal in a very high level. So it's a, it, you just have to, you just have to adapt. Uh, we, I, I didn't have a lot of time to adapt, you know, like you only have like a few months, but I, I never have excuses in my life. I, I like to have, I like challenges and I embrace them. And those players that they have like a very, very big personality. Uh, so I, I think they, they will adapt extremely well for the futsal game. So then let me ask you this for individuals that are used to playing the outdoor game what would you tell them about what playing futsal could do to help them round their game out or even add to their game outdoors what what would futsal do for outdoor specific players you think obviously what i'm gonna say gonna sound extremely biased right <laughs> uh just because i am a futsal player you know i, I i'm originally uh, from brazil and you know, I when I when I start to play uh, soccer back in Brazil, uh, you don't start to play outdoor soccer until 12, 13 years old. Before that, it's all it's all futsal. Uh, futsal help outdoor soccer players for multiple things. Uh, it, it helps you with with your touch. You know, it's a small size uh, game. You have to make sure that your touch is good, otherwise you're gonna lose the ball possession. He helps you with uh, um, how much of a high pressure uh, you're going to be able to deal with, you know, like a, a player's pressure in you. You're not going to feel the pressure with the ball. Uh, the way how you think, you know, uh, it's quicker think. Uh, you know, obviously, it's a, it's, it's a lot of cognitive work involved with futsal. So a, a youth soccer player, especially uh, growing up, if a player can start with playing futsal or playing futsal at the same time as, as soccer, it, it helps a lot. Uh, just uh, as example, uh, if you have a defender and outdoor soccer, the defender, he doesn't get involved a lot with the ball all the time, right? But a defender in futsal, which we named Fixo, he needs to know how to play. He needs to know how to pass the ball, how to receive, how to move in between lines and all this stuff. So you get a kid that be playing defensively in futsal, for a long time, and you add this player in an outdoor, you're going to become an amazing defender. You're going to become a defender that not only can disarm the opponent's team, but he also is going to be a threat to a threat with the ball. So futsal add a lot, you know, one v one, how to break lines, how to how to play, you know, inside of the midfield. Again, you know, I'm passionate passionate about the sport, so I'm extremely biased, but I can see uh, so much of the benefit. Um, in futsal for an outdoor player and like I always said uh, for me uh, clubs should implement futsal at a young age and if they did that it would be extremely smart to form better players, better technical players because in the United States we already have the physicality, we already have the kids with a lot of desire of playing and we have talent but now you add futsal you're going to add the technical ability that they need Coach Good luck at practice this morning. May the flight to Nicaragua on Sunday get everyone there in one piece. You've got a week to train before everything kicks off April 13th in Managua, Nicaragua for the CONCACAF Futsal Championships. Good luck. Get that, uh, get that title for the United States. Get as deep as you can. Looking forward to seeing how things go in Nicaragua. Thanks for hanging out with us on the morning show. Good luck at practice. Good luck in Nicaragua. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And we're going to be fighting hard uh, to bring the, the trophy back. Thank That's you. very cool. Everton Moreira, the head coach for the U.S. men's national team when it comes to futsal. That was cool. Literally, he's driving to practice this morning in Utica, New York.
and he's on the highways and the byways, and he is, and he was, uh, he was practicing safe, safe interviewing. He was, he, he was practicing safe interviewing. Everton Moreira, the head coach of the U.S. Men's uh, Futsal National Team, they are heading to uh, Managua, Managua, Nicaragua on Sunday. They're going to be practicing for a week. They have in their group. Trinidad and Tobago, Dominican Republic, and Guatemala, and that is like 13th, 14th, 15th. It is rapid fire. Bang, bang, bang. And they are going, trying to get out of group, and they are trying to, for the, for the first time in two decades, bring a bring a uh, championship to the United States when it comes to futsal. So once again, thanks to uh, Coach Moreira for uh, hanging out with us this morning. And like I said, he's heading to practice. He's got practice going on. So he's, he's good to go. Uh, that was a cool way to start the show. Uh, <laughs> so that was your opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at kickoff coffee and kickoff coffee, co.com. That's your QR code. For those of you who are hanging out and watching us on Twitch, on YouTube or on the 280 character app. And, uh, once again, you go to kickoff coffee and kickoff coffee, co.com. You use the code soccer down here, 15. They in turn take 10% reinvested in, uh, they take 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10% reinvested into the youth game, youth initiative stuff that they have earmarked. Once again, thanks to our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. So that's how you start a morning show, uh, literally. On, on, on his way to work, the uh, the head coach, Everton Moreira, of the 14-player the roster for the CONCACAF Futsal Championships that's going to be next week in Managua, Nicaragua. So we caught up with him on his way to practice. Thanks to Jeff Crandall. Thanks to Jason for uh, making sure that Coach Moreira could do that at this time of the morning. Like I said, literally, he was driving to practice. And so we caught him. Uh, we caught him on the highways and byways in Utica, New York, and are getting ready for. He's getting ready for uh, USMNT futsal championships. Uh, he's getting ready with the USMNT for the futsal championships in Concacaf next week in Nicaragua. So very, very cool stuff there. Hi, uh, it's a Friday. We've got a very busy show, and it, uh, here's your traffic. At ten o'clock, the commissioner of NISA will be dropping by, John Pruch, and it will be. Uh, discussion about what's uh, going on in NISA currently. And uh, obviously, they are starting their season, the regular season starting this weekend. And they've already had some folks in Open Cup. They've made some inroads in Open Cup. But because of what is going on in this footprint with two clubs specifically, that is going to be a part of the conversation. It cannot be ignored. And so we're going to be discussing what's going on inside NISA, getting ready for the 2024 season, inroads in open cup but we've got to talk about savannah clovers and we've got to talk about uh the new club on the block which was an old club on the block and georgia lions scfc is now georgia fc and they are apparently going to be playing at silverbacks park and they now have a new director of business operations in preston jarneski and uh, karim dazer who you may know from his time at dalton state georgia military college and at Georgia State is going to be the new sporting director. So we'll, we'll, we'll have questions. We'll find out what's going on in NISA. And we will uh, get all that prepared in hour number two. We've got the weekend whip around, patent pending, trademark coming sooner, hopefully, rather than later. We'll preview all the action. We'll go through all the juice boxes. Uh, obviously, news for Atlanta United yesterday for the trip to NYC. No Gigi and no Shande Silva. Uh, obviously, Gigi, it is diagnosed as a bone bruise. And so uh, no Yorga Shakamakis on this trip and Shande Silva and a ductor injury. It was disclosed yesterday uh, by uh, head coach uh, Gonzalo Pineda. And so they are going to be short. Those two individuals on the front line heading to City Field to take on NYCFC. So it looks like it's going to be some combination of Tyler Wolf. And maybe Edwin Mosqueda on the left a little bit, and Daniel Rios and Jamal Tire. So that's what uh, you'll be looking at in some combination on the front line. So it'll be interesting to see what happens at practice this morning and to see how the, the group is, is pieced together. So uh, once again, you'll have you'll you'll have young legs on the on the edge, possibly with Tyler Wolf. You'll have Daniel Rios, who is uh, getting to full song, and you'll have uh, the birthday boy. The, the, the birthday brace boy, Jamal Tire, scored two on his birthday last time out. And so feed the hot hand. And so we'll see what happens uh, with the lineup up front when it comes to uh, NYCFC. There's some other injury news involving other clubs. Uh, Roman Celentano for FC Cincinnati. He is out. 
And so it might be Alec Can who will be in net for FC Cincinnati uh, on the weekend. And we'll see for how much longer it might be Alec Can between the sticks for uh, FC Cincinnati uh, as we go forward. But uh, once again, thanks to uh, Jeff Crandall at U.S. Soccer. Thanks to Jason for catching up with Jeff. And once again, thanks to Coach Madera as he was heading to practice this morning. Very, very cool stuff there. Uh, morning, Alex. Morning, Abby. Abby reminding us tonight that it is a night before party at Fado Midtown from 6 to 10 for those who uh, will be uh, participating and are interested in what's going on with She Believes Cup. There's a night before party. And let's see how uh, everybody does on the quick turn. So it's from 6 to 10 at Fado Midtown tonight. But the question is, uh, after 10 o'clock, you've got about 14 hours before a kick. But then, of course, the actual uh, the tailgating is supposed to start, I think, at 9 a.m. So you're going from possibly, for, for those that may do this, you've got folks that might be going from the night before party at Fido Midtown, might be a little bit of hair of the dog, uh, first thing in the morning from uh, 9 to 12 to get you ready for She Believes at uh, 12 and 12.30. Oh, boy. Uh, park- so, Abby, what you're saying is with parking lots opening at 7.30 in the morning that uh, there might be folks going from one place to the other. Uh, I see how this goes. All right. Uh, I definitely could see some hair of the dog for some folks in the parking lots uh, first thing Saturday morning as we get ready for She Believes. Yesterday it was announced that current ticket sales for the match, 46.5. Once again, we're looking for 49,540. 49,540 was the attendance uh, for the ticket sold for the, that's the highest amount for a friendly for the women's national team. And that's what the She Believes Cup is. Technically, it's a friendly. So if you can get, oh, you got to have 3,500 there. You, you got to have 3,500. You got to have 3,500 more folks wandering in the door. You've got to. You got to crack 50,000 for this one, folks. So 46.5 for the tickets on sale right now, and uh, you got to crack 50,000. You figure with the walk up with the double header, uh, USA, Japan, Brazil, Canada, you figure that you got to get walk up north of 50,000. So kickoff, uh, once again, pregame show on 92.9 the game at noon, and it'll be uh, Jess and Jason, and they'll be doing play by play at 1230. Once the match is done, Jess and Jason race to the airport. And Jason flies to LaGuardia. And he talked about it yesterday here on the show. Lands at 7.08. And he says they, they say it's 15 minutes from gate to curb. So that puts him at 7.23. He has the sum total of 17 minutes. Because you know when you walk out of the, the front doors at LaGuardia, you can look to your left and see City Field. It is, it is literally over there. You see Dylan Butler Estates, you see City Field. It's, it's that way. So it is within his sight. But the key, but the key is going to be getting that credential at media will call. Will someone be at the media gate holding a credential for Jason? Holding that credential. So Jason doesn't have to go to media will call and he can just go right in the media gate. I hope that someone on social media, on the social media team and on the communications, on the uh, the uh, video side, the production side for Atlanta United will be with Jason on this rush. But that's the key. If everything lands the way it's supposed to, if it's 15 minutes from gate to curb, that puts him 17 minutes to kick. Can he get from LaGuardia's curb to City Field in 17 minutes? Or actually, sorry, can he get from LaGuardia's front door to the curb where they let him off to get into City Field, to get in through the media gate, and be ready for kick at 740. Please, someone, someone, someone from the production team with Atlanta United, follow Jason on this quest. Jessica, uh, Jessica Charman, after she calls the match, she'll be heading to Charlotte for the match against the Revs. Uh, WFNZ, they still call things uh, remotely on the road. So Jess's quest to get from Hartsfield to Douglas and get to WFNZ, that's a little easier. But Jason, 17 minutes, if everything goes well, from curb to curb to media gate, I'm, I'm bypassing media will call at the moment. So from curb at LaGuardia to curb at City Field, 
into the media gate with his credential. Hopefully someone kind of like the, you know, the, the four by 100 meter race where you have the baton and the baton this time is the uh, credential. Jason grabs a credential at the media gate, goes in, goes up the elevator, and he and Mike go at 740. Ah, so we'll see. All right. So that is uh, that is the quest. 92.9 The Game has, she believes, and 94, Star 94 has Atlanta United and NYCFC from City Field. Shea, whatever you call it. If City's sponsoring you, you can say City Field. If Shea is sponsor, if not sponsor, if City's not sponsoring you, you say Shea Stadium. So there you go. Uh, that's where we are. All right, 9.30. Actually, it's 9.31. Wow. I've uh, I've yammered a lot this morning. All right. Uh, it is time to catch up with our mogul in training, and it is time for uh, the special open that comes with uh, this particular segment, and it's always great to catch up with our friends from Beyond Goals Mentoring here on a Friday. That means we roll this open. Cap, what is up? Good morning, John. Ooh, uh, uh, tilt the head. Yeah, tilt the head down a little bit. We got to see. We, we, we got to see the lid. We got to see what there we go. There yeah. it is. Uh, what have you thought so far about the, the folks that you are uh, representing on your head? What have you thought so far about the experience as a mogul in training at Rhode Island FC? Um, it's going all right. We had a, it's been a, a good start to the season, not a great one. Um, we've had our first two games, two draws. Both winnable games. I suppose both were losable. Um, but the optimist in me looks there like you we, go. we could have won both both games. Um, last two games have been away games. We've had the lead in both away games, which has been great. Um, but our, our last we our game last weekend, we played away at Tampa and got a schlacking in the second half. Um, and it really wasn't a schlacking in terms of like play. We just had some bad mistakes that cost us and uh so that's all right we uh we played dell's team this weekend um <laughs> so it'll be a, a good way for us to bounce back oh there we go shots fired he's only been in the booth for two minutes uh what how, how much of a as this continues to be a learning experience for you uh did you ever think that in all of the learning that's been going on and all of the build that you would be learning some of the lessons either on the field, off the field, or both that you would be learning, whether it is patience or whether it is being driven crazy and trying to control your emotions about what's going on on the field and sitting there and resisting the impulse to put on an RIFC jersey, kind of like Sasha did with Des Moines Menace in, in Open Cup. And uh, are, are you having things that you're having to kind of sit there and bite your tongue about? No. Um, and I have to actually calm down some of the other board members where I'm like, guys, it's okay. Wow. Like, you know, okay. hey, one bad half, um, some mistakes from some guys, like it's all good. Uh, we'll be fine. Um, you know, look at the positive side side of things. So uh no, just trying to use my experience in that. Um, you know, I think the team has looked uh pretty good uh so far this year and, and dealing with a lot of uh, difficult circumstances being a startup, right? And yeah. playing out of college and, you know, not our own facility and all those types of things. So, um, no, I think it's been a good start and uh, I'm not I'm not concerned about it. But, um, yeah, for me, it's more learning how much I can help out the coaching staff versus kind of leave them be, um, you know, and then not – so much because I don't trust them, but just more like, Hey, how, can I be of help? Um, you know? And so I watched the game a couple of times last week and threw a couple um, videos to the coach and said, Hey, you might want to bring these up with some of the defenders. Um, so, you know, I, I, we have a really good relationship, which is nice. Um, Kano and I, so uh, I, I feel okay doing that type of thing with yeah. him, especially. Yeah, and, and I mean, this it's a, it's in a way, uh, I, it's a different kind of mentoring because what you mm -hmm. get to do is it's peer, it's peer, it's peer to peer in this case where you're, uh, you're not trying to sit there and you know be this you know corporate overseer and go rar you know and you have to say it with the rar you know it's literally you're you know hovering over folks and it's just like it's 
advice that you're giving because you see something and you want something to succeed as opposed to in other situations with other individuals, the ego might be involved. And it's like, you know, well, I know better these kinds of things. This peer to peer stuff is really important, especially with something new like this. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, you know, I think the coaching staff is really open to it, which is great. Um, right. I think they understand like, hey, we're all we're on the same team. We're all in this for the same reason and want to have success. And nobody's trying to <clears throat> show up anybody else or step on anybody's toes. We just, we just want success. Uh, we had the head coach of the U.S. men's futsal national team on uh, before you this morning. They are getting ready for the CONCACAF championships in Nicaragua starting next week. They've got a week to train, a week to train, and then I think on the 13th is when they kick things off, uh, both Sweet. literally and figuratively, chasing after a CONCACAF title. When it comes to doing other sports, I know that it's something that you recommend, and it's like, you know, in the spring, hey, go and do other things. Don't, you know, don't do this 24-7, 365 you know, and twice on Sunday and do it eight days a week, you know, when you want to play the sport of soccer. Is there a sport that you didn't participate in when you were younger that you recommend now to help out those younger athletes and your mentees? It's like, I didn't do it, but I think this would help you. Or is there still just, you know, okay, I think that this will help you. I did this and this will help as well. Was there something that you might have missed out on that you're helping uh, the next generation with, or is it still the same thoughts that you had when you were younger that helped you helped out your balance? Well, I don't think that there's <clears throat> any particular sport that'll help you become better in soccer. I think that you can take things from any sport. Mm -hmm. um, like I've mentioned before, baseball, I was always thinking, well, what am I going to do with the ball when it comes to me? You know, I think basketball, any team sport, you really can um, apply a lot of things to, than soccer when you're playing soccer. So I think that you can learn a lot from any sport, honestly. Um, I think if there was one sport that I would have enjoyed or got some benefit from that I didn't do is swimming. Okay. Um, just because I think it's a great cardiovascular workout and it can get you so strong as well. And it doesn't put any stress on the body. Um, I mean, you know, you know what I mean? It's yeah. super no, I, difficult. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's but, I mean, but I mean, someone who's, you know, 712 years old, like me, I can go into a pool and I can do hydrobic, you know, hydroaerobics. And that way that you're not getting as much strain on your knees. You can run in a pool and there are added benefits that you don't have the stress and strain of, you know, pounding, you know, pounding the turf with tennis shoes that you could do in a pool or something like that. Yeah, totally. And I think as far as like off season workouts and things like that's it's such a great uh, way to get a good workout in. Um, yeah, swimming is just so so challenging for those of, for those of us, especially that don't do it much. Um, so tiring. So um, that that would have been one. But I'm just because I played most of the other sports um, outside of American football. And I mean, it, and you know, you get to, to broaden your horizons and you get to go in different directions. And as you said, it, you, you might stumble across something that is beneficial that you wouldn't have thought of uh, initially. And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm down with the idea of the swimming part, because once again, you think that it, and it makes it fun almost where, you know, like if you're in a pool and you can sit there and you can, you know, mess around in a pool a little bit, but if you still get your laps in, you still would do whatever having fun in that second activity or that third activity will almost act as I think a refresher when you go back to your primary activity in soccer. Yeah. I got to spend some time away. I got to do this. This helped me do this. This helped me do this. And now it almost gives you that fresher perspective when you go back to that first sport, I would think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, absolutely. I mean, We've talked about it a lot, right? You have to enjoy what you're doing. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get much out of it and you're not going to have long term success for sure. Um, right? The motivation will go away real quick. So, yeah, um, that's always no, that's always number one um, is, is, is enjoying what you're doing because um, you'll get the most out of it, obviously, when you when you're doing that. So. Yeah. No doubt about it. And I mean, when you when you go through these kinds of things and you're kind of figure out what works for you and and all of that. I mean, it, it, at times I would imagine that, you know, when you find those other things and we talk about it, you know, you enjoy what you're doing and it applies to a larger picture. When it comes to feedback that you get from your mentees about the entire experience, you know, 12 months a year. And I would imagine 
uh, that your men that your mentees are with you 12 months out of the year, right? It's not just an in season thing. If they want to contact you in their off season, they can do that, right? For sure. Okay. So when they're not in their primary sports, are you still getting that off season feedback about what's going on in their lives and those kinds of things? Or is it something literally that's like, uh, you know, it's that nine months and I just, I want to talk soccer 12 months out of the year, or are they talking to you about those other things that they're not involved in in the other three months or whatever? Yeah, sometimes. Um, I th- I'd say more often they take the break, um, which is totally fine by us. And, yeah. and there's, then there's some kids that want to know, okay, what should I be doing during my break? And how can I still get better during this break? And what should I be doing? Um, type things where we have these conversations. And <clears throat> and as we gear up towards a season, we try and focus on goals and, and um, little um, things that we want to accomplish this season. Yeah. Uh, so that we make sure that we're just prepared and we've got an idea of what we want to do with the upcoming three months, six months, whatever it might be. But there are definitely some kids that just want to get away and don't want to talk about soccer. And I respect the heck out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so then do you, do you and Greg, how much learning do you guys get from your mentees. I mean, I know that it's a that it's a two-way street when it comes to feedback and everything, but do you learn from your mentees perspectives that you didn't have uh, going into a situation? How, how much how much learning are you guys getting from your mentees because I know the mentees are learning a lot from you guys. What's the reverse? Yeah, it's constant learning. I think that just understanding how to have conversations and how to figure out what this player or family wants to get out of these sessions and how comfortable they feel. And how do you approach a session with someone who doesn't want to talk at all? Mm-hmm. Um, I had a session a couple of weeks ago with um, a young athlete who didn't want to be on the camera and didn't want to talk. And so I kind of had the conversation with dad, with the player on the side And, um, you know, that was unique. Um, But you got to have to meet some of the athletes where they are, right? You can't force these things just like we talk about having fun, right? I don't want anybody to be bored or hate getting in front of a camera and talking to me because then they're not going to get anything out of it. We're we're wasting each other's time. Yeah. Uh, And and that's, I mean, I find that I find that interesting that, you know, there's there's an athlete that you hope that a mentee that you hope wants to learn, but for whatever reason, they, they might be, you know, they might be shy about the whole thing. I, you know, it's like, just write me something. Uh, it's, it seems like there are those times that that is, that is a challenge for a mentor is trying to find the right way to get in, get in touch with a mentee. If they don't want to do things on camera, if they, you know, if they, don't want to talk. I mean, there, and look, there are teenagers that in all situations and you as a dad, I imagine go through this too, that there are times in teenagers lives where they don't want to talk about nothing. They'll they'll come, they'll come home. They'll come through the front door of the house. They'll close the door. They want to go upstairs and they just want to close the door to their bedroom and just kind of, you know, be themselves and not want to talk to anybody. When it comes to knocking on that door for a, for a mentee that doesn't want to uh, for whatever reason, they don't want to, they don't want to talk, you know, they, like I said, they, they could be shy about the whole thing. They just don't, they're not there for it. Uh, they feel like they might've been pushed into it by their father or, you know, by their, by their parent. I mean, how much of a challenge is that for you to understand the context of it and talk to a parent and sit there and go, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Are you seeing the same thing? Let's get together here because I'm just here to help. How much of a challenge is that? Yeah, sometimes it is because, you know, I think a lot of parents, they, they mean well, of course, but, um, you know, you can tell sometimes that it's being pushed on the child to, you know, speak with us or do extra work or, hey, my kid's not practicing enough on their own and and those types of things. And, you know, honestly, in those con- in those situations, it's better that the parent is is part of the conversation so that I can speak to the kid and the parent can hear like what types of things I'm talking to them about and what's important Um, because 
I don't necessarily always address exactly what the parent wants because uh, maybe I think that they're stepping too hard on the, on the child or whatnot. And it's like, Hey, you know, if the more that they're having fun, the more that they'll be motivated to go do that extra stuff, not being forced into doing it type thing. Um, so for sure it's a balance. Um, and that's, that's definitely a challenging part of it, but getting back to your other point earlier about, you know, camera shy and, yeah. um, kids that don't want to just, <clears throat> or, you know, maybe you're awestruck or, have no idea who we are and, and don't care that way. Um, we have Greg and I have thought about like, maybe we should put together a kind of a, a package thing that someone could, you know, look at and go through on their own where it's got like some videos and some teachings and some things that, you know, then they don't have to have a meeting with us. They yeah. can do it on their own time and in their own space. And um, so we have, we've had, discussions about that and sort of started to look into that and figure out how do how do we put something like that together so um specifically for people like that well and i think that that would be a cool thing to to add to the the whole experience because you, you mentioned the idea of being awestruck and i would think that for someone who is a fan of atlanta united talking here in our footprint that someone who knows and they grew up watching Atlanta United and they might have been a, you know, an eight, nine or a 10 year old athlete that they know about you and they know about Greg and they know about, you know, you and confetti and hoisting a trophy and all these kinds of things here in town. And they might be a little intimidated by those kinds of things. So I, I would think that, you know, trying to find that icebreaker, I guess, for, for lack of a better phrase, you know, that, that, that they might be awestruck. And it's like, look, that individual is over there. This is who I am, and I think maybe that the, the bio blast kind of a thing that the portfolio that you and Greg are, are thinking about, I think would help in some aspects. Where hey, this is me, this is what I've done, but now I'm here to to assist you and what's going on. You might be a little, you might you might be a little awestruck. You might you might remember you know moments at Mercedes Benz and things, but right now I'm just you know I'm just Mr. Parkhurst and Mr. Garza, and I'm here to help you. I mean that that seems like. At sometimes that might be a uh, an icebreaker that might be a little difficult to get through at times. I would think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I just smirk to myself because I think that's the most awkward part of a conversation with a new mentee is: do they know anything about my career or yeah. everything about my career, or any and or somewhere in between? Yeah. So I don't. I don't ever assume that anyone knows anything um about my career because now it's i mean it's been four years since i retired it's been a while so um you know some some kids know everything and that there's some kids that have no clue who i am um which is fine but in those cases i feel like i need to give them a little bit of my background so that i'm not just some joe schmo over here talking to them that you know why the hell am i talking to this guy <laughs> on a camera right that my parents signed me up for so um that's that's a, a little awkward every time <laughs> It's uh, Joe Schmo from uh, Beyond Goals Mentoring at BG Mentoring on the Twitters. Uh, he's Joe Schmo, and I'm just John. Um, but no, and I think that dealing with those mentees in the extremes, it's like, you know, who is this joker? Uh, or, you know, oh, I saw him growing up. And it's trying to draw those extremes into the middle and, and have them try and understand the, the greater idea. It's like, no, we're here to help you. Yeah, you, you might remember, you might remember, you know, me as Michael Parkhurst. Uh, it's like the old, the old Simpsons gag. It's like, you may remember me from movies like 310 to Yuma, you know, one of those kinds of things with, uh, with Chet Brockton and trying to, you know, the old driver's ed films, those kinds of things. But it's like dealing in the extremes with an individual, you've got to draw them into the middle and say, look, I'll come, you know, whatever image you have of me, I'm coming to meet you here in the middle so we can both learn together. And so I think that that's, that's key to this whole thing. But yeah, I didn't, I, I legitimately does anybody think of you or Greg as a Joe Schmo? Seriously, are they are they over there at no knowledge base at all? <laughs> I mean, when we're talking to kids that are twelve years old, shoot, I retired when they were eight, so um, there's no there's no ill will um, from no. our perspective. <laughs> I get it. No, but it's like, but yeah, it's just like you know, I mean, but I think that maybe the the bio blast or you know the the dossier, it's like. Here, here, here's who I, here's who I was when I was a professional athlete. I think that that could help those that are just sitting there thinking, great, I've got Joe Schmo as a mentor here, you know, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that might be the side, the, the side, the side heading for beyond goals mentoring Joe Schmo mentor, you know, I mean, but two but Joe Schmoes talking soccer. Yeah, there you go. Two, two Joe Schmoes, you know, two Joe Schmoes talking soccer, but I mean, it's, but no, you, you present an interesting point here. It's like, there's everybody out there that is giving advice. I mean, you, you lit, I mean, it could, it, it could be you, it could be Greg at beyond goals. It could be, you know, it, it could be Jurgen Klinsman giving advice. It could be Bob Bradley giving advice. You know, it could be Clint Dempsey or, you know, Don Ovan or whomever giving advice. And it's up to you and Greg on a daily basis, I would think, to sit there and say, here's why hearing from us is beneficial. It's almost like you've got to, to put yourself out there all over again for folks that think that you and Greg are just two Joe Schmoes talking soccer. Yeah. And that's honestly the, the worst part about, um, I, I can't, I dislike doing that above anything else. Um, I hate selling and I hate even, I hate even the promotion aspect of it just because I feel like, and I know that we need to do it just because yeah. what we're doing is, is for good and we're trying to help people. And obviously we've got some knowledge, um, in the area, yeah. but I always am like, well, if, if people want the help, I'm here to help. Um, like I don't want to force anything or, or do anything like that. I'm like, you know, here, I'm here to help and this yeah. is where you can find me. But I, yeah, I can't stand that part of things. Well, like, I should be working with the crew Academy here, but, um, you know, I hate like pushing to say, Hey, let me help you. I can help you type thing. I'm like, Hey, if you guys want it, I'm here. Yeah, well, and that's and I think that that plays into the idea of the human ego, because there are some that will sit there and they'll puff out their chest and go, hey, look at me. I did all these things. And that's why you should come and see me and, we'll, and I'll teach you about soccer. And then there are others who aren't as wrapped up into their athlete selves. And, and it's it's not about the ego. It's about the effort. And it's about the, the end of the, the end game, honestly, where you're here to help. And it's a delicate balance about self-promotion and then feeling uncomfortable because you think that there's too much ego involved about, you know, you're announcing your name. Hi, it's me. I'm here to do this. I mean, I get it. I completely get it. The balance of you know, think folks thinking that it's an ego play versus genuinely wanting to help folks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Does that drives you crazy. It does. That's why Greg does it far better than I do. Um, you know, he's, he grinds a lot more than I do. And without him, we wouldn't have three fourths of the business that we do, um, or clients and things. So, um, you know, he's, he's, he's much better about it than I am. Um, We've all got our strengths and weaknesses, I suppose. Well, but that's and that's why I think that, you know, that, that you and Greg do really well in that that Venn diagram of two Joe Schmoes talking soccer is because you each bring something different to the table. And when you combine the two of you in that Venn diagram, there is that middle part that is the same thing. But that that the two 50 percent come together and you guys do a really good job because you come at it from different angles each time. Indeed, indeed, John. All right. So before you go. Um, one more thing this week, Atlanta United is going to play in a unique environment. It's not quite the U 12 futsal pitch at Yankee stadium, which is apparently regulation size air quotes, regulation size. They're going to city field and mm -hmm. NYC says, uh, well, I mean, you could in theory at city field, you could be going you're going from the first base, you know, first baseline down the left field foul line. NYC takes those dimensions that are regulation at Yankee Stadium and they bring them over to Flushing Queens and City Field. What's it like playing in a band box? What's it like playing in, in, in a U12 futsal pitch? Does it drive players crazy? How much of an adjustment is it? And what's it like playing in an environment like that that is just odd and it's off the rails as it seems every time out? Yeah, there's a few unique challenges to playing at New York. And one is the field is like sideways. It's like crooked <laughs> in that when you look at it, 
it's it's weird. It's on an angle. So when you're on the bench and you're looking across the field, you're not looking at a straight line. It's like crooked. So the offside lines is weird, um, right? When you look when you look across, you have to look on an angle. Otherwise, you're not looking at the right line. Yeah. Weird. Um, so that throws me off every time I play there. Um, but then it's a weird balance between it's a small field and things can happen quickly and they can close you down fast versus I still can play. I can still have a little bit of time to play because New York city does somehow everyone else feels like they can't play at that field. And yet New York city, especially under Vieira, they played every time. Every, they always played out, right? They weren't just kicking the ball along. They somehow they had space to play, but the away team never does. I, I don't know. It's baffling. <laughs> um, you know, so that's definitely a home field advantage for city. Um, yeah, but it's, it's difficult to go there and get a good result. So, um, you know, I feel like you just make it ugly and grind and know that it's going to be gross and uh, <laughs> that's okay. We just come out of there with a point. Was, and now I saw that we're, we're missing a couple starters um, in the attacking mm-hmm. side of things, which will make it even more challenging. So um yeah, it's yep. tough, very tough. Yeah, no Gigi, no Shande up front this weekend. What's going on with Beyond Goals? Uh, quiet week. Greg's on vacation. I spent last week um, down in Fort Lauderdale with the Gressel family. Um, so it was great to catch up with them and see them and um, went to went to Miami training. And then they've got a beautiful facility down there as well. Um, really nice setup and went to their game. And it was a Good atmosphere at the game too. Um, enjoyed enjoyed the time down there. My son got very lucky and met a certain number ten. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I've heard so, of that. Yeah, and it was good to see Tata on staff. Um, I was going to say, did Tata recruit you for the back line, considering how injured they are? He did make a joke about it, and I said, "Hey, I think if you want to win, you don't want to <laughs> ask me twice." <laughs> I know. Um, I just have this vision of that conversation. I don't doubt that for a second. <laughs> but they're they're doing great. It was good to see him and good to catch up. So, um, and then Greg and I have a, another uh, video analysis session that we've been doing. Kind of, I don't know, about twice a month, maybe. Um, we've got one this Sunday night where we're focusing on wide midfielders and wingers, where we just show defensive and offensive clips and kind of just show of hey. You know, movement type stuff, things you should look for, crosses, um, you know, just uh, generalized uh, information for kids. So uh, and those have been great. We, we enjoy doing that. Looking forward to it. Uh, Cap, as always, thanks for pulling back the curtain on what's going on there at Beyond Goals and letting us know what's going on at uh, Rhode Island FC. Uh, right like said, bro, you got yours on you got yours on your head. I got mine over my left shoulder. So there we go. It's always it. right there. Thanks, as always, my friend. Be safe. We'll catch up with you in a couple of weeks. Sounds good, John. Have a great weekend. That's Michael Parkhurst. Mogul in training, Michael Parkhurst. And uh, so, yeah, that's uh, it was it was interesting to hear Cap talk about at the end of our conversation about the whole idea of self-promotion. And, you know, it, the idea of putting yourself out there as an authority figure. And our folks, you know, and Abby, to the point that you made on the Twitch pitch, you could have those kids that are completely and totally intimidated by the whole thing. And they don't really want to talk. And you, you could probably just visualize the shoulders shrinking and they're getting very small on camera. And then there are those that don't want to be there because their parent has put them in this situation. Yeah, you need to learn from Michael Parker's. Then the kid's going, who? And so it, it is that battle of, who is this person? And I've seen this person growing up. I might be intimidated by the whole thing. And it's a delicate balance. And then Michael talking about the difficulty of self-promotion. And that's, you know, I think we all go through that. And just right now in this particular case, it is, you know, where you're trying to help and you're not putting yourself out there as, hi, look at me. I'm, you know, number one. Uh, I'm here to help, period. Bang. End of sentence, end of story. And I can I can and I can imagine that at times it's difficult for a mentor. Doesn't matter what frame of reference we're talking about when it comes to mentoring. But mentoring 
in this particular context, it could be difficult because, okay, so why should I listen to you and not listen to so-and-so? And you've got to be that much more confident in the idea and figure out what's going on and be comfortable in yourself and in the knowledge that you really are helping somebody. But no, I can understand how uh, uncomfortable it could be for, uh, for a mentor and for Michael in this case to, uh, to be putting yourself out there and want to help and not feel like it's an over-the-top kind of a thing. You're there to, to satisfy the, the athlete in you, the, the professional athlete. But yeah, Michael says, like, if I'm talking to somebody who was 12 now, they reti- uh, I retired when they were eight. And unless you really know who that individual is, then, you know, it's like, well, why should I listen to this person? And that's all part of the, the idea of mentoring in and of itself. So uh, really interesting conversation. And I can't thank Michael and Greg enough when it comes to opening up about what it's like to mentor and try to do this in today's environment as they're learning how to grow beyond goals the way that they are and piece it together as best they can and try to help as many, as many folks as they can. And the fact that they've talked to folks associated with Atlanta United, they talked to the academies, they talked to high schoolers. And it's been very, very cool to see that continue to grow. And like I said, I can't thank Michael enough for being open and honest about uh, what it's like to, to be a mentor in this day and age. So uh, thanks again at MF Parkhurst on the Twitters and at BG Mentoring on the Twitters. That is, as always, our Friday free kick. And we get to go down roads that we don't necessarily anticipate when it comes to hanging out with Michael and Greg. So very, very cool stuff there. Uh, once again, coming up here in hour number two, it is uh, we get to learn about NISA and find out what's uh, what's going on there as they kick off their season. And we'll see what's uh, we'll see what's going on there with uh, with our friends at uh, NISA. And obviously, once again, we have to discuss what's going on with the two franchises here in the state of Georgia. Some of you might have known and run across the the uh, Kartik Krishnayer uh, interview that we had with our next guest. And we'll talk about some of those topics. We'll talk Open Cup, but we'll talk about the teams in our footprint. And uh, once again, can't thank our friends at NISA enough. And we bring in here to kick off hour number two, the commissioner mm-hmm. of NISA in and of itself, John Pruch. Commissioner, thanks for coming on. Yeah, uh, Sure, John. It's good to meet you. Uh, I uh, Going into this, I apologize mm-hmm. ahead of time if this turns into rapid fire Q&A and things like that. Um, I know that I have you only for a limited window, so... Uh, I do want to talk about the season kickoff. I want to talk about Open Cup and obviously the two teams here in our footprint. So then let's start off with uh, what you've seen so far with the clubs that are in NISA in Open Cup. There have been some successes with some folks. Uh, yeah, I'm actually very proud of what the Stars have done and and Irvine Zeta. Ir, you know, Zeta is a, a brand new club for us and uh, they've uh, gotten off to a good start. So I'm very proud of both clubs. And I, I know that uh, you're you're looking at, at these at these clubs. I know Michigan got two on the board, and uh, Justin Miram, who folks know here in the Atlanta footprint, was a part of it for uh, for Michigan. But you know, when you talk about a, a club like Irvine coming out of the blocks, having that kind of instant success, what's it been like to see a, a franchise like that come online in your league and then instantly get markers like this? Well, you just hope it continues, right? I think it's, uh, you know, they're in a great market, right? I mean, Orange County, Southern California has got a lot of talent. And and I think they've really done a good job of preparing themselves for the season. Um, uh, we've been, um, they've been involved, you know, with us through NISA Nation and now NISA for a bit. So they understand the landscape. They have a great venue. Uh, so I think I, I th- I'm cautiously optimistic that they, uh, are going to be not all just off to a good start. I think they're going to continue. When you look at the 2024 season coming to, into play, I know it's starting a little later than you would have liked, but sure. when you look at the 24 season coming up here in short order, kicking off this weekend, what were some of the lessons from the 23 season from a league standpoint that you are bringing with you forward that you hope you will learn from here in the 24 season? So if I go back in time a little bit, uh, we had the pandemic for a couple of years and bubble tournaments. When we came out of that, the boardroom really wanted to have a national league, right? They wanted to, and it really became a burden 
um, on, on clubs financial burden. I mean, you know, if you look at the cost of travel last year, it just went through the roof. And so it was a, it was a financial hurdle for our clubs. And so we decided in the off season, um, and we started building the model for it, uh, last about a year ago, not quite nine months ago, um, to do a regional play. And we're going to continue that. Uh, the club seemed to enjoy it. Um, they don't get to play each other, you know, across the country in this schedule as much as they would like. Um, but it, it's driven down the costs uh, considerably. And, and that's a very positive move, I think. And I think as you, you'll see expansion going forward, we're going to try to uh, expand those regions uh, and maybe even add a third region over time. So I think it'll uh, really help our clubs. Well, and I think that what that also does, in addition to the the travel component and the economic component, is that it does create those those rivalries inside, for lack of a better term, conferences or divisions that are self-contained. And then you you really do get the idea of determining that true champion because, hey, we didn't play the folks in the West, if we're here in the Eastern footprint. We're saying, right. hey, we didn't play the West until the bitter end. And so you do get the best in the East and the best in the West or whatever your division or conference makeup is yeah. at the end of that whole discussion at the end of a year. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And we love Darby's. I think, um, you know, we had a big one in Michigan for a couple of years and uh, it was very intense. We're going to get to see a repeat of that in the open cup here in a couple of weeks. But I think, but those Darby's uh, the fans love them. Uh, and uh, you don't have that too much in, in the other leagues, um, you, a little bit in 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 MLS, obviously with Galaxy and LAFC, but I do think that because of of the way we're structuring this, those derbies will really start popping up. You know, a Savannah, um, a Georgia FC uh, rivalry could really start um, gaining some speed here. I think uh, we'll get into Savannah and Georgia FC coming up in just a sec. Uh, when it comes to you, you mentioned expansion. So mm -hmm. when someone knocks on your door in that league office they came up to they come up to the building they literally knock on your door or carrier pigeon or fax or email or whatever they do these days no. i'm interested in being you know a a franchise in nisa what is the vetting process <laughs> and what kind of investigation does the league do in sitting there and saying okay we think you'll be a good partner and a good representative of our league what is the vetting process like at NISA when folks want to come in to be a part so there's um a, a lot of um in person interviews right uh, net worth verifications uh, background checks etc um but i will say that that vetting um is you know, only gets you so far, right? Um, there are times when we bring in owners that are more than highly qualified, um, but it just decide that at some point it's not for them. I think, you know, it's hard to measure the spirit of the person, you know, are they going to see this thing through, even though it's a very difficult road? And um, I like to tell people that it's the will to survive, right? And to get to the point where you can thrive. And, and sometimes, you know, people are willing to do that in their core businesses, but they look at this as not necessarily their business. They look at it as a, a soccer club that they've always wanted to own. But it, it's different. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge uh, for a lot of our owners. And so it's hard to measure that. And, and so we do make mistakes in that process, right? I think we, we're getting better, but we do make mistakes in that process. So when Georgia Lions came knocking on your door and were announced in January, you can, you can be as privy with comments and conversations as you wish. But when they came knocking on your door, and the league did the vetting for the individuals, uh, Verhout, specifically Mr. Verhout and Ms. Patel. When they came in the door, they knocked on your door. Hey, we want to be a part of it. And you vetted them. What was the, the, the overall discussion? It's like, OK, this will work. What were the, the, the determining factors in saying Georgia Lions will work? in Conyers at that current time in early January? What were those, what were those in question? It was really more about, it wasn't about um, Patrick at all. I, we'd only had one or two conversations with him. It was really about uh, Sunita. 
Uh, Sunina is really a quality individual. We got to know her. Uh, she is very committed to the project. She loves giving back to the community. And I, I think she, uh, as it turns out, got uh, sideswiped a little bit on this whole process. And then we ended up with some management members that were part of the Patrick uh, deal. And uh, so we had to jump in. And as we all know the story now, we jumped in, we had to clean house and we had to say, you know, we're not, we're not ready yet to play the open cup. We're not ready to ha to host the uh, interconference uh, play that was scheduled to be in Georgia. And, um, and so we then relied on um, our relationships uh, to try and build a management team there. The first person we contacted was coach K who I've known for a long time. And uh, Coach then started doing his own work on vetting out people. And um, and so I, I'm comfortable now. We are where we should have been, um, but we are where we are now, uh, getting ready to start the season. I think we're be way behind, obviously, but uh, the people want to do it. Um, the coach and and, uh, and the staff want to do it. And I think it's a long season, so they'll it'll be a bumpy road for the first month or so. But I think um, once the, the players get comfortable with each other and uh, I think they'll be OK. So uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Who is the owner of Georgia FC? Yeah, uh, technically, right now, it is still Sunita. She's still uh, struggling. Um, because of all of this and um, the impact it's had on her life. Uh, we have a lot of support for her. Uh, we are, we do have a couple of uh, investors that are involved with the league that are helping that cause right now. Um, but um, it will make a long-term decision down the road uh, on Sunita, but she, she appears to want to continue to move forward. Uh, but she was, I will say she was very rattled by all of this. And with uh, looking at the schedule right now, the release said that it's going to be in one particular stadium in the northeastern section of the city of Atlanta. There are some dates in Dalton, which is a two hour right. haul. And I know mm -hmm. that that's uh, Coach uh, Kareem DeSeres, that's his home turf with North Georgia Soccer Academy. Yeah. Is that is that the plan where it's going to be a, a by by venued home schedule for them or what? You know, that was it was a little bit of a um, OK, coach, um, we'll allow you to have a couple games up there. He he uh, uh, the, the intent is for it to be at Silverback and, and um, we will play the Independent Cup games um, in uh, Dalton and we'll play a couple of the league games in Dalton. And I think that's that's more of a nod to Coach K and his academy and letting his kids see what can happen if they're really dedicated to this. You know, what will happen next year, you know, we'll see. But our intent is we are an Atlanta club. So Savannah. And mm -hmm. uh, there have been some published reports recently where the, the league is helping Clovers make ends meet. Uh, what is the current status when it comes to the league's involvement with Clovers and having them as a franchise for the full season in 24? Yeah. So I, I just correct one little thing that you said. Uh, we are involved. Um, it's investors that we brought in to help the situation. Let me give a little background on that. Sure. We started seeing some issues um, six months or so ago. Um, the primary team owner, who is still the primary team owner, but he started, he's out of South Africa. There were some geopolitical issues going on and moving assets or, or capital. And so things started to slow down, um, payments and stuff like that. And so in the first quarter, um, it became obvious to us that we were gonna have to step in if we wanted Savannah to play. We love the market, we love, what uh, Brian and Jeff Defoe did there in building that club from an amateur uh, to a pro. And we just didn't feel it was right for the market or right for that club to say, no, you can't play. Right. So we stepped in. Uh, Jeff Defoe is coming back to run the club. Um, David Proctor, the coach, is doing an amazing job of holding it together. 
Um, and again, it, you know, you, you never want to be involved as, at, at the league level, especially with independent clubs, but sometimes you have to, if you really want to make sure that that club survives. And I think those three individuals, Brian, Jeff, and, and David will do a good job with the club. Again, it's off to a, a later start. You know, we, you know, we saw in the open cup game the other night that, you know, they just haven't had enough time together yet. Yeah. And that will take time. Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> they have a road trip tomorrow to Michigan. That ought to be a pleasure. But I think I, I think David will have them ready uh, for the for the match. And we will see. Right. And, and there were signs in that game the other night. It, it, it The talent is there. The attitude is there. It just there were times when you could tell that they just hadn't been together enough. Right. Where they get stretched a little bit and, you know, on defense and stuff. So it, it is what it is. But we're we're very pleased with the, with the, the the management of the club and and the direction of the club. I was going to ask what kind of a leash length do the uh, clovers have when it comes to searching for investors, getting those mm -hmm. folks vetted, getting them in the barn, approved NISA approved kind of a thing. How long of a leash are you giving clovers so they can be a part of NISA? Mm, pretty long. Uh, we are working together with them. Um, uh, we've identified a couple of potential investors uh, that love the market, love the club. Um, and so over the next couple of months, a decision will be made. Uh, but we and by the way, one of those investors did come from the management team. When it comes to uh, Division One, Division Two, uh, U.S. Soccer Federation certification, mm -hmm. so on, these kinds of things, there are certain metrics that have to be met when it comes to net worth and these kinds of things. I think mm -hmm. for. Division one, I think it's what thirty. If uh, if the if it's a consortium, lead owner's got to be thirty five percent, and I think right. net worth has to be twenty million or something like that, or at least presented in paper to sit there and say, "Hey, I'm worth 20. Uh, second division, I think it's thirty five percent, and they've got to be worth fifteen. What kind of parameters uh, are you guys looking for in NISA when it comes to someone who knocks on your door? Uh, or, I mean, is there a franchise fee that it is non-refundable when they're interested when it comes to what you're looking for from a financial standpoint? What kind of investors are you looking for? Yeah, so uh, PLS for Division Three is $10 million. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole PLS, but it is pretty arbitrary. Right. Uh, I made a comment in another interview the other day that um, D Division Two women's net worth individual for 30 that 35 percent what we call the primary team owner is six million division three men's is 10 million so what does that tell you right i mean come on mm -hmm. so i think um uh, but what we do is is obviously the the, inv the investor has to be worth you know 10 million dollars um and to us again i'll go back to what i made a comment earlier all of them are worth over 10 million dollars Okay. Some of them are worth many multiples of that, right? I mean, we do have some owners that are extremely wealthy. The, but it's but again, it's never about the money, right? Um, it, it's really about um, their their mental and and emotional ability to see it through. Um, I think uh, the the other problem I'm having, I have. And I've been vocal about this uh, for a couple of years about PLS mm -hmm. is you cannot have a community own the club or you cannot have a 501c3 uh, own the club. And which is unfortunate. Um, I like to comment that if this is the only country where Barcelona couldn't have a pro team. And it, it, it creates, uh, there are clubs, and I'll use Chattanooga as an, as an example down in your neck of the woods, right. it was community owned. I mean, basically, right? I mean, it, it truly was community owned and they restructured their balance sheet to, to be able to qualify. So it, it, and they were able to do that. But in many cases, that's not the case. You, get, you take some of these clubs that have been around 80, 100 years in this, in this country. Wow, that's a big ask. Right. To, to, to restructure their balance sheet so that they can have one guy be the guy. Right. Yeah. Tough. I can't thank you enough for coming on to discuss what's going on. It's been a difficult walk here in the off season. It still is with mm -hmm. a couple of franchises here in our footprint. I know that you mentioned losing Chattanooga FC to 
uh, to uh, MLS Next Pro as a part of it and having to deal with what's going on with Georgia Lions FCSC and now Georgia, now that they're in this third incarnation in basically a three-month period. I know that that's not ideal for what's going on there at the league office and especially with what's also going on in Savannah. But uh, I give you full credit for coming on and being transparent about all these kinds of things and walking folks down the road and giving us a, a bit of an education as to what it's like there in the league office trying to, to navigate nine franchises, keeping eight on the board and, and keeping certification and all these kinds of things. I can't thank you enough for coming on uh, to kick off your season. I know that I wish we were talking about more stuff on the field, but I'm glad we got to talk about that in addition to the issues folks were asking here in the footprint. Sure. Well, John, I appreciate your time. All right. Thanks. And uh, we'll talk again. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thanks All again. Right. That's, that is the uh, commissioner of NISA. That is uh, John Pruch. I give him full credit. I mean, legitimately, it was like, uh, I know that I want to come on. I'd like to have the commissioner come on and talk about what's going on in the league. And there are some issues with some franchises here as well. And so I, I give him absolute full credit for coming on and we do have some answers. And so that's, uh, that's uh, good to know. And so we'll have these answers and we'll go here in the opening weekend of NISA here across the board, getting the answers on Clovers, getting the answers on uh, George FC. So, uh, once again, there you go. We got to 10 20. Um, but now we know that the owner of the new franchise, the third incarnation of the franchise, Georgia Lions F FCSC, is Georgia FC, and it is uh, Sunita Patel. And so we have answers when it comes to Georgia Lions. And uh, so it is in Ms. Patel's hands, at least at lead. And with uh, Preston Jarneski, uh, Director of Business Operations, Krim Dasser as the new sporting director. And it is correct that when you look at the NISA schedule, they are playing at Silverbacks Park. There are some odd start times. You've got Friday 5 o'clock on the board right now, if you look at the league schedule. You've got a Friday 5 o'clock. You've got noon on Saturday in the summer. Odd start times. But I imagine right now, as you're trying to knock on the door and go, hey, you know, we're looking for a venue to play at. When can we play? And there's only certain times made available. And it just so happens it's in the heat of the day in the summer in the city of Atlanta. So it's not a story that we're going to stop. But I give uh, Commissioner Pooch full credit. And thanks again to our friends at NISA. And uh, knowing that it was going to be a warts and all kind of a thing. So Steve Johnson... Thanks to him at the league office up in Chicago. Thanks to Commissioner Pruch for being a part of the discussion as well. So that is the uh, that's your NISA update today. So Georgia FC owned by Sunita Patel. And we'll see what happens with this club and net worth and all those kinds of things. So he did mention uh, the profit loss statements for Division Three, ten $10 million. And so we'll see. All right. So there you go. That's the update on Clovers. And that is the update on uh, Georgia Lions SCFC, Georgia FC. Season kicks off this weekend in Nisa. Okay. Man, it's been a full show. Uh, thanks once again to uh, our friends at U.S. Soccer. And great to catch up with uh, Everton Moreira, the uh, head coach of the U.S. Uh, National Futsal Program, as they're heading to Nicaragua, catching up with Michael Parkhurst, and catching up with the commissioner of NISA, John Pruch. So it's a full show so far. Now, for the remaining 40 minutes, we got to go through the weekend and let you know what's going on around the planet. And uh, thanks to everybody who let us go through all of the uh, the, the guests and everything. A and uh, and Alex, uh, yeah, it is like a corporate self-evaluation, getting back to what Parky was talking about. Uh, are you tying this to my compensation? Do I have to toot my own horn? Because that isn't me. I know. And that's the thing. He's... He, Michael is not the only one that is tied to that, but, uh, but there are some folks, there are some folks that are kind of like, uh, you know, some folks that we know, at least from our, our growth, uh, growing up, you know, li like our old buddy, uh, double A Arn Anderson. I don't want to say I told you so. I don't want to blow our own horn, but toot, toot. We are still recipients and owners of all the trophies. There you go. So uh, that's what Double uh, A Arn Anderson is uh, is all about. But no, thanks to thanks again to everybody that's been with us so far this morning. Uh, good morning, Orange and Black. I know it's early, 
And uh, I think Irvine Zeta actually plays in Championship Soccer Stadium, as a matter of fact. So uh, there's your, your little bit of NISA USL Championship crossover this morning. So uh, good to see Harry. Good to see Abby. Good to see the O&B hanging out. Morning, Alex. Morning, Hutch. Uh, let's see. Uh, and it's a morning, Abby. Abby's uh, doubtful. Abby's doubtful. It's going to be a long run for Jason getting from the gate to the stadium. Um, Chick-fil-A opens at 6. Public service announcement. Chick-fil-A opens at 6. Open on Saturdays. Parking lots open at 730. Boy, do I think there's going to be a lot of hair of the dog that is going to be uh, in the parking lots at Mercedes-Benz tomorrow for She Believes Cup. Uh, Alex, U.S. Soccer and MBS. Everyone else should be giving tickets to every youth soccer club, nonprofit, et cetera. If you can't sell at least, fill the seats and create fans. Alex is like, yeah, and Abby's like, I know it's not MBS, it's U.S. Soccer, but Alex is like, yeah, they ought to just go ahead and do it. Absolutely. Just fire off. Abby still hates Tampa because she's a she's a Fort Lauderdale Strikers person. Beat the Rowdies. Everybody beat the Rowdies. And uh, we're getting into the idea of all the other sports as well. So uh, there we go. All right, Major League Soccer. We'll get into uh, juice boxes, and we'll get into as many divisions as possible. We'll get you into the news of the AM and uh, let you go. Yes, Michael. Michael had coordinate was coordinated to uh, get the uh, the talking walking heads to carry the spike. Very cool. I was like, I, I I was looking at the big board and I saw it and I'm like, wait a second, isn't this the the match day that it's supposed to be? So Easter Sunday, yes, Easter Sunday, and I see two folks that live about a good four iron from here, Office HD. I see the two of them on the right hand side, walking the spike down the aisle. Very cool. Uh, yes, very, very cool. All right, let's get into juice boxes and let you know what's going on when it comes to activity in uh, Major League Soccer, USL Championship, League One, full weekend across the board. What to know and what to watch. We already went through the uh, the uh, the folks and uh, uh, of what uh, what it's going to look like in some places. FC Cincinnati's loaned uh, Arky Ordonez to a Swedish club. They signed uh, Red Bull signed Cameron Harper to a new deal. We talked about Inter Miami signing their second round draft pick Leo Afonso, and they put him straight into the lineup. That's what you're looking at. By the way, FC Cincinnati signed Yamil Assad. Don't know how many of you remember uh, knew that, but yeah, Yamil Assad got signed by FC Cincinnati. Galaxy have acquired Colombian defender uh, Emilio Garces from a Deportivo uh, Pereira. That was back on a Tuesday. 22 year old center back, international roster spot. Joins on loan for this season with a purchase option. So he made his pro debut with the DP in 2021. So he'll be part of the center back core with Yoshida and Casadas and Jalen Neal. Casadas and Neal recovering from injuries. Eric Zavaleta has been the one to partner with Yoshida as of late. So uh, that is that's where we are with uh, the, with the actual transactions. We're still transacting, folks. We are still transacting when it comes to uh, everybody coming in. Uh, no Stian Gregerson, obviously, for Atlanta United. No uh, Gigi and no uh, Shande Silva this weekend. So it'll be interesting up top. For uh, Austin, Capetti questionable. Veronica questionable. No Arfield, Bender, Cambridge, or Scardina. Uh, also on the board, no Chase Gasper. No Andrew Gutman. Once again, the left-back situation for Chicago is still there. No Wyatt Omsberg. Uh, FC Cincinnati, pretty healthy. Uh, crew. No Camacho, no Matano, no, no Christian Ramirez, uh, Jesus Ferreira, Ijara Mendy, Pomacal, Velasco all out for FC Dallas, DC United, Steve Birnbaum out, Canals out, but not due to injury. And uh, also no Garrison Tubbs as well. No Ache Ache or uh, Quinones for Houston. I mean, Bossy and Eric Sviachenko, both questionable. LAFC, fairly healthy. Jalen Neal out. But once again, that's why they bring in a uh, center back from Deportivo Pereira. Inner Miami, no Farias, no Frey, no Freira, Kritsov, Messi, Redondo, Robinson, Avilas, and Kramoski. Kramoski is now upgraded to questionable with his sports hernia. Uh, Minnesota United, Zarek Valentin, CF Montreal, looks fairly healthy. Nashville, no Leal, no Walker Zimmerman, questionable. Lucas McNaughton and Shaq Moore. Uh, for City, keep an eye on Morales, Talos Magno, Miadovic, and Burke Risa. Red Bulls, questionable. Emil Forsberg, keep an eye on that. Uh, for the Union, Flock is uh, really their only injury at present. Timbers, keep an eye on Bravo and Mabiala. RSL looking fairly healthy, questionable. Fidel Barajas, Justin Glad. For San Jose, 
Daniel Marcinkowski, out. Jackson Yule, questionable. Seattle, we talked to Nico yesterday. No Baker Whiting, no Leo Chu, no De La Vega, no Rodriguez. JP, questionable. Obed Vargas, questionable. Keep an eye on those. Uh, for Sporting, no Johnny Russell, no Kyrie Shelton. Fontas Polito, questionable. All caps, no Lewin, no Nilsson. Questionable Tim Parker. Toronto, no Insigne, no Lorea, no Petretta, no Cervania. Keep an eye on Sean Johnson. And no Brian White for Vancouver in these matchups. So uh, that's what you're, you're looking at there. With the uh, juice boxes across the board, let's see how much has actually changed from when we discussed things with Nico yesterday. And now that we uh, have Atlanta United on the table, I want to know what you're thinking about Atlanta United. What's going on in your mind about United going into this matchup against NYCFC? What's on your mind? Questions, concerns, confidences? Let me know. That's what we're here for. we got a half hour to go. Crew in D.C. United. Crew still a favorite in and around minus 150 in the juice boxes. And remember, this is a composite courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. FC Cincinnati favored, but on the plus side against Red Bulls. FC Cincinnati's a plus 116. Red Bulls are a plus 244. Messi and friends, which right now are and friends, coming off of what happened in the midweek. The only benefit of what happened in the midweek is they're at home this weekend against Colorado. And they're a minus 119. We talked about it yesterday. The and friends coming off of uh, the heartbreaking loss you, uh, where Ruiz gets three, but two yellow cards in a four-minute span. Up 1-0, lose 2-1. You've got to go once again in the midweek to Monterey to try to come back after that one-goal deficit. There's some news on that in a bit. Man, there's some news on that. Uh, Miami, minus 119 on the board. Very interesting. Hosting Colorado. What is that side going to look like? Is it going to be Luis Suarez? Do you sit Suarez knowing that you're going to need him on the road? Might be an interesting, uh, might be an interesting look. It might be uh, Messi and friends, too. It might be some of his lesser friends going up against Colorado, seven thirty in South Florida at a minus one nineteen. Colorado's a plus two ninety one. Draws basically a plus two ninety five. Revs hosting Charlotte, and we had an interesting. How do we say this? An interesting quote. From Caleb Porter. Caleb Porter basically guaranteed a win. He guaranteed a win against Charlotte. He is favored. Do not get me wrong. Juice boxes have the Revs favored at home against Charlotte. Dean Smith, the head coach of Charlotte FC, said, quote, he shouldn't make promises he might not be able to keep. Caleb Porter, we're going to win Saturday. I promise that. I wonder what Shooter thinks about this. Shooter McGavin, our resident Revs fan. So Caleb Porter has promised a win for the Revs. Dean Smith's already chirping back. The last time Caleb Porter made a promise like this was in 2022 when he was the head coach of Columbus Crew. Where he said, what, I'll bet my house that we uh, that we make the playoffs? 2022 with Crew. I'll bet my house we make the playoffs. What happened? Crew didn't make the playoffs. They were... First place out of the playoffs. I think they were seventh or eighth that year when he was head coach of the crew. Then he became no longer the coach of the crew. So already at this point of the season, Caleb Porter is guaranteeing victory. He's going full Joe Willie Porter here. We're going to win Saturday. I promise that. You have the option of dialing up, I mean, outside of the uh, outside of Apple TV. You do have the option of hearing Willie P and Jess 
You go to WFNZ, you dial them up independently. It won't be on. They, they don't have an away radio option yet on Apple TV, and they need one. You have the chance to hear uh, Dave Feldman on the local radio option for the Revs, or you can dial up WFNZ independently and listen to Willie P. and Jess call this one. There's going to be some added spice there. But remember the last time Caleb Porter promised something like that. It didn't go well. So we'll see what happens. Atlanta United, New York City, once again, Atlanta United, a big underdog at a plus 254. That's changed a little bit. NYCFC favored at a plus 106. That has dropped, and it's gotten closer to zero, uh, to plus 100, to even money. So Atlanta United uh, dropped a little bit. NYC is coming back to the plus 100 a little bit. Uh, part of the uh, club of Canadiense, uh, Vancouver, big favorite at home against Toronto FC. Once again, no Insigne. Vancouver's at a minus 196 at home, a minus 200. Don't touch that one with a 10-foot you-know-what. El Trafico's at 745. That one is at a minus 122 for LAFC at BMO Stadium. LA Galaxy are a plus 282. Draws a plus 313. So you might, if you're looking at this one, and, and uh, the four and a half, say, with the total, I think that was a plus 230. So keep an eye on that one as well. LAG, a big number on the road, cross town, going from Carson to BMO. That's big. Uh, Austin FC at 830 at a plus 114. Hosting San Jose. San Jose is a plus 231. Not a whole lot in this one, I don't think. I think Austin is a big favorite at a plus 114. Chicago Fire at a plus 125 hosting the Dynamo. Dynamo, once again, no Ache Ache. And uh, that's really lacking in firepower on the road. Chicago at a plus 125. Maybe because they're at home. Plus 125 for the Fire. RSL, plus 227 on the road at Minnesota United. You're going to give Chicho Arango a plus 227 against Minnesota United. Okay. Draws a plus 258, by the way. That's gone up. And uh, Nashville. Nashville and Philadelphia. Nashville's a plus 152. Draws a plus 238 at Geotis. Philadelphia is a plus 175. This game, and I'm checking the total on purpose. Over under one and a half, a minus three fifty six. So if you went a one, if you went one nil, one side wins. Minus three fifty six. Two is a minus two twenty eight. Honestly, this could be a one one draw. It could be one nil. Could be one one. If you if you are, if you go to she believes cup. Let's say you go to She Believes Cup, you stay for the doubleheader, you get home, you're tired, but you can't go to sleep. Bet you if you turn on Nashville and Philly, you might just fall right asleep. Take the under, maybe the draw. That's what I'm thinking. That one is not going to set the world on fire. St. Louis City, all caps, hosting FC Dallas at 8.30. They're a minus 123. Still don't have their firepower up top. Don't know how healthy they will be, but they're at home. Traditionally, they're at uh, City Park. Tough place to play. FC Dallas isn't having a whole lot of firepower. Got a lot of folks injured and dinged. I got to go with all caps. And then we talked to Nico about Seattle and CF Montreal. Seattle's a minus 152. And CF Montreal's a plus 430. That number has gone up. That number has exploded since yesterday. That's a plus 430 for CF Montreal. Seattle, big favorite at home. Could be a get back, could, uh, could be a get right game for them. And they need it. Uh, on Sunday, your one match at 145. Sporting hosting Portland at a minus 112. Draws a plus 275, and the Timbers are a plus 283. So that's your juice boxes for Major League Soccer. Yeah, uh, Tom uh, Rios in some sort of training yesterday. Fingers crossed he can go. Here's what I think it'll look like. Obviously, with no Shande and no Gigi, it means, yeah, Dell, we did. And he called you out. We had Parky on, and he called you out. He called, he's like, uh, he said that, uh, yep, he was getting ready to play Dell's team. Home with kids on spring break. Yeah, we had Parky on at uh, 930, and he did mention you by name in the Charleston Battery. So he, he is anticipating the matchup 
with Dell and the battery. So I'll post the uh, the show will be up uh, probably within the hour, and uh, then the individual segments themselves. We've got a very very busy show this morning. But yes, he did mention the battery, and he did mention you by name. Dell's Charleston battery. So that's there. Um, so Tom mentions that Rios was in some sort of training yesterday. Here's what I think is going to happen. It's going to be some combination of, here's the, here are the individuals, as I, as I say, here's what I think is going to happen. Here's the list of individuals that you have for those positions. Shot for Shande on the left. Tyler Wolf. Uh, you don't know what the, the health status is of uh, Derek Etienne Jr. Can he give you some minutes if you need it? Do you move Mosqueda to the left-hand side? Uh, you might have that as an opportunity. Uh, you've got for Gigi, it is some combination of, it is uh, Rios. Don't know how many minutes he can give you. It is Jamal. Feed the hot hand to the birthday boy. And then you also have Nicholas Firmino. So it could be some combination in those in those two locations. Here's what you have. You've got the birthday boy. The birthday brace from Jamal. So I would imagine Jamal gets the start. You feed the hot hand. You've got Rios. You don't know how many minutes he can give you. You've got Firmino that you can have, although his role might be a little deeper. Left-hand side, you could have Firmino. You could have Tyler Wolf. You could have Mosqueda on the left. So my guess is, is that you start the birthday boy. You've got Rios behind, and you've got uh, Tyler Wolf available, Mosqueda available, Firmino available. It's a lot of youth, a lot of speed. And in that regulation facility at City Field, and yes, I did just once again use uh, air quotes. You uh, you might need folks running around a little faster and uh, basically slamming it into fifth gear the entire and the entire day. So you might end up with a couple of substitutions. So you start the hot hand with uh, with Jamal, Rios behind, Firmino behind, Tyler Wolf on the wing, Firmino available over there, Mosqueda possibly playing on the left hand side as well. So, like I said, you got a lot of youth, you got a lot of speed, and you're going to need it. But I think that uh, I think that conventional wisdom would dictate that the birthday brace and Jamal would be your starter. Like I said, feed the hot hand. He got two, he's feeling good. He had the relationship with Brooks. I mean, Brooks has that relationship with whoever that striker is coming down the middle. So, you're going to have to be on the hop the entire time. But I think It'll be Jamal, but once again, you will have available to you some combination of Rios, Etienne, Wolf, Mosqueda, Firmino. That's what you're looking at for those two slots in the middle and on the left and to help you out uh, with your substitutions for a Saba. Like I said, Saba would have Mosqueda would be the, the natural substitution there. But once again, you bring him in, you slide folks over, you slide Brooks up, anything can happen. So you have all of those folks that you can reference in these situations. Jamal, Rios, Etienne, Wolf, Firmino, Mosqueda. So that's what you're staring at heading to NYC. And like I said, it is a regulation size pitch. They just take their dimensions from uh, Yankee Stadium. Oh no no these are the these are the same dimensions as Yankee Stadium and they are they're legitimate they are regulation so you'll see that once again you'll see that once again at City Field but Atlanta has options and they're all going to have to be in fifth gear from the absolute beginning so it will be uh, interest it'll be interesting to see how things lay out once again let me know what you're thinking when it comes to Atlanta United NYC any other matchups on your on your mind I know Dell's got uh, RIFC on the brain. So we got all that going on. Uh, it, it's Tom. It is. Let's put it this way. Tom asks, isn't city actually a bit bigger? It could be if they wanted it to. Let's phrase it that way. But I think what they do is they take the dimensions that are regulation from the Bronx and move them to Flushing, Queens. 
this is the field that we play on here, so why should it be any different here? On TV, the angles, and Parky got into this this morning, talking about the angles of playing in New York. It's just odd, period. So the regulation size pitch that we have in New York, in the Bronx, I think it's just transferred over. So it is not, uh, it is a regulation pitch. So, and I know that when we watch on television and you look at something at City Field, it does look bigger. But my understanding is, is that NYC pulls the dimensions from the Bronx because it is regulation and just puts it into the field at City. That's all they do. Just, hey, this is, this is our, these are our dimensions. It's regulation here in the Bronx. We're taking the same size field and putting it over here. What we need at City Field is Peter Vermees and another measuring stick. Because remember, Vermees was the one who went into the Bronx and he actually measured it off, and it was like 67 yards wide. It's like 66 or 67. So, uh, yeah, so they take, uh, yeah, they take the dimensions and uh, apply them, and I think that's what, they, that's, that's what I hear anyway. Uh, wives tale is that I think that since the uh, dimensions are regulation then you just move them over um, I'm actually doing a Peter Vermes uh, okay so Peter Vermes in 2015 said that Yankee Stadium's pitch was 106 by 68. 106 by 68. FIFA regs and MLS standards mandate a minimum of 70 and 110. So if you are going into, so uh, so, uh, so 110 by 78, 77, so 7,700 is the number in theory, if my math is correct. So, 110, 70. Two zeros, 77. So 7,700. 7,700 square whatever. So 7,700 square yards. So 106 by 68. No one said there'd be math on this show. So 848, 6, 3, 6, 8, Oh, one, two, seven. So you are literally at 7,208 compared to 7,700. You are five, you are seven and a half percent, basically, seven and a half to eight percent smaller when you play at Yankee Stadium. And we know what that is. It means that you've got to be faster. You've got to react faster. Your margins are closer. You are looking at things kind of, sort of. But, yeah, you're looking at something 75 to 8% smaller in surface area when you play at Yankee Stadium. So, yeah, well, yeah, and <laughs> and Hutch, Hutch goes, if I was an opposing coach, I'd take a good tape measure, do a bit of measuring with the ref present. Hutch is recommending a number four ball, but uh, but yeah, my my uh, my understanding is that since the uh, dimensions at Yankee Stadium are regulation, and they're just moved over. Vermes had it at one hundred six by sixty eight, five hundred basically uh, square yards smaller, eight percent smaller by surface area when you go to Yankee Stadium. So that's what you're staring at. So we'll see if the, the challenges are the same. But no, to your point, it does, in the TV lines, it does look larger playing at City Field. But once again, everything's kind of squished and your sight lines are a little different. And it's not quite right there as it is like when you're watching at Yankee Stadium, but we'll see. They invented, <laughs> um, mm, man, shrinkflation. Um, so Dell asks, are there any benefits to playing there that you can adjust to? I mean, if you had 
if you had a roster that was predicated on quickness, because and what Gonzalo Pineda does, and, and I give him full credit for doing this, and I would imagine that other coaches do this as well. When you go to New York, when Gonzalo Pineda knows that he's going to New York, he will cordon off that space. He will take his practice field from 110 by 70 and go to 106 by 68 or something like that. He will make it shorter. So the guys are used to playing the balls that they're used to playing a little differently. You know, maybe take a little bit off, hit a little harder, those kinds of things. But as Michael Parker said, you know, still when Patrick Vieira was there at NYCFC, they still played out of the back. And so I think it's quick passes. I think it's being in touch, uh, making sure that uh, you have folks who can dribble out of trouble. So I think that if you're looking for anything that you can adjust to, if you've got good dribblers, you've got solid passers, you know how to get out of trouble, uh, you can be a little imaginative, and you can adjust quickly, especially with the way that that ball pings around in there, especially when you get inside the 18. It literally is having to do with ball skill, reacting faster, and making sure that you are cognizant of where you are on the pitch the entire time. Because the 18 gets up to you a little quicker than it would normally when you play in the Bronx. So passing and uh, making sure that you've got you know guys who can pass, guys who can dribble, and yeah, do we have any players with a futsal background? I don't know. I should have asked. Ever, I should have asked Everton Moreira when he was let off the show this morning. Hey, do you know any guys in MLS that have any futsal backgrounds? So it literally is, it's getting out of trouble, knowing where you are at all times, good dribbles, good passers, and making sure that you can get from point A to point B quickly. Quick turn, quick transition, and be ready defensively because of that shorter width size, your back line is going to have to be on the hop the entire time. They're going to have to know what's going on all game long and it is mentally tiring as well because of having to be playing in that pinball machine that's there so you've got to have guys who are mentally whose mental acuity is at about 125 percent the entire time so you could see guys because they're running around so much because they're having to think so hard you could see some earlier substitutions because they've been running around so quickly. Uh, who has not played at City Field before? I would think a lot of the younger guys. Yeah, New York Minute, <laughs> New York Minute, <laughs> and New York City football pitch. Um, so the the younger guys, the newer guys, I would say, uh, well, obviously it would be a lot of, the, I would say a lot of the guys, frankly. Um, let me see the last time Atlanta United played at City Field. Uh, Atlanta United... If I could type, Atlanta United City Field. So we'll go to the last time that Atlanta United played at City Field and get that lineup out there. Uh, not for April 6th. I need like the full, no, and I don't need an event right notification. Um, let's see. Mm, 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 mm. I know this is working really well for great radio. Uh, let's see. Info to know. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, United key players. NYC. Uh, field size. Atlanta United has yet to play at City Field. Every team knows that dimensions of the pitch at Yankee Stadium don't meet FIFA's minimum standards. And this is Doug from the AJC. Atlanta United is unsure if the pitch on City Field will be closer to normal. Pineda has said the team has practiced if it's a few yards more narrow than normal pitch. So, Atlanta United has never played at City Field. So, that's the answer. According to Doug, never played at City Field. I know Toronto has, because I remember Michael Bradley there once. Uh, but Atlanta United has not played at City Field, according to Doug. So, so no experience playing at City, but there is experience playing at Yankee Stadium. Assume that the pitch is going to be the same size. And so Gonzalo Pineda has shortened 
the field just to get used to it. And, it, and heck, if it ends up being 110 by 70 by some active measurement deity, then they know what that's like. And they practiced in they practiced in a smaller environment and they've got all this room to breathe. They've got an extra seven and a half to eight percent to breathe. So we'll find out. Uh, uh what? Emilio posts an earthquake story? Holy crap. In New York, as of a half hour ago, a 4.7 earthquake rattled New York City this morning. This morning, a 4.8, well, 4.8, 4.7, felt throughout the tri-state. Centered near White House Station, New Jersey, 40 miles west of New York City, according to the USGS. No reports of damage. Are you blanking kidding me? Yeah, Hutch, no tsunami warning issued. Because, you know, Long Island Sound and those tsunamis, man. But you want to know what the earthquake is? The earthquake is freaking Jamal T.R.A., the birthday boy. That's what your earthquake is. That's your earthquake. Tri-State knows Jamal is coming. Four, well, it's a 4.8 OB. It's a 4.8. Barely enough to get out of bed. See, that's the thing. You, you talk you talk uh, four points to the folks out west, and they're just like, yeah. I have those in my soup. Rich Ransom, did you feel this? Wow, unbelievable. A 4.8. And all of the meteorologists in the tri-state area for all of the New York TV stations and everything, they're freaking out right now. A 4.8 magnitude earthquake. That earthquake's Atlanta United, brother. Coming into the coming into the friggin' tri-state. That's what it's all about. Wow. Who knew that we would be talking about earthquakes and the tri-state? Sister-in-law in Syracuse felt it, said it was like a train super close to the house. Something 40 miles, the epicenter, 40 miles west of New York City. And felt in Syracuse. Are you crazy with this? But that rumble's just Atlanta United coming into town. That rumble is Jason Longshore flying into town at the last minute and getting to City Field. That's what it's all about. You want the rumble? You deal with the rumble. You deal with Atlanta United going to play NYC at City Field. That's that rumble. This was your pre-shock. This was a four-shock. I'm waiting for somebody to cut a promo for me. Hutch rode out a six and a half in Seattle in 67. Fun watching the road turn into a waveform. Yeah, no joke. Uh, there's always that one with the the uh, the suspension bridge. And you're just going, no, I'm not driving that one. Um, Emilio in 87 felt the one in Queens. That is nuts. Absolutely crazy. Throughout the tri-state, reports of building shaking and rattling came from New Jersey to Long Island. Kathy Hochul, Mayor Adams, briefed. 4.8. That's insane. Mm. So basically, it was a Jersey quake. It, so legitimately, it was a Jersey quake north of Trenton, between Trenton and Allentown, Pennsylvania. And our friends at Orange and Black say it, that, honestly, 4.8 is a big quake if you're not used to them. Yeah, the tall, yeah, dealt the tall buildings. Now everybody's going to have to sit there and, and figure out what's going on. Michael's in a 5-plus in L.A. No, it's not fun. Well, at Ropes, I don't know if it's a Red Bulls quake or not. Maybe Forsberg's coming back. I don't know. But, yeah, 40 miles west of New York City. So, uh so it is, uh, Ropes is calling it a, a Red Bulls quake, technically, as you get out to Harrison. But the Red Bulls are on the road. They're in Cincinnati. So it would have to be an NYC quake by default. 
So uh, did not have that on the bingo card this morning. Good night, Irene. Uh, our, <laughs> wow. Uh, let's get into uh, quickly uh, the other stuff going on, the other juice boxes on the weekend tonight. Uh, tonight. FC Tulsa is an underdog at home with Phoenix Rising and USL Championship. Favorites tomorrow and Sunday. Detroit City favored against North Carolina. Hartford Athletic on the minus side at home against the Miami FC. Loose City and Indy 11, which is going to be on CBS. Lippa FC, the Louisville Indianapolis Proximity Association Football Contest, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on CBS. And CBS and USL Championship have their own theme music now, apparently. They didn't release a snippet, but they do have their own theme music for the game on CBS, 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Lou City favored. Memphis 901, a home underdog to Orange County SC. I know that OB's happy about that. Evening, Pittsburgh favored at home at Highmark against the Rowdies. I know Abby's happy about that. Rhode Island, underdog at home to Dell's Charleston Battery. Battery or a minus 110. Rhode Island's a plus 250. Colorado Springs, an underdog at home to Sacramento. Sacramento's a plus 135. New Mexico at the at the uh, at the lab is a minus 102 to El Paso Locomotive. Uh, Roots are a plus 120. They'll have the Oakland Coliseum all to themselves for the foreseeable future. Sacramento, you've got to be joking. Roots are a plus 120 hosting Monterey Bay. Vegas Lights, a big underdog to San Antonio FC at a minus 101. I know Harry's happy about that one. He anticipates a win. Birmingham favored at home at a minus 118 Sunday afternoon against Loudoun. Also, uh, in uh, League One, Greenville is uh, favored at home against Northern Colorado. They both won an Open Cup in the midweek. What's the uh, physical status going to be of the folks who are left over? Greenville to plus 122. Hailstorm on the road to plus 196. Tormenta hosting Lexington SC. 7.30 7.30 on a Saturday night. Tormenta favored at a minus 104. Lex SC is a plus 227. So uh, you got that in your in your juice boxes. Uh, Hutch, New Jersey has many fault lines, including the Ramapo Fault. Significant ancient crack in the Earth's crust. Separates the Piedmont and Highlands physiographic provinces. Man, I did not know that we were going to be talking about topography today. And uh, OB... East Coast quakes are crustal rebound from the Ice Age. Ice Age glaciers were so heavy, they pushed the crust down, and it bounces back. Wow, that's wild. Um, then let's see, what was the... Uh, so, apparently, and let me get into uh, other news of the morning before we go. And we're probably going to go over time a little bit. Uh it looked like uh, Messi and friends got into a bit of a confrontation. Messi and other members of Messi and friends got into a verbal confrontation with Monterey coach Fernando Ortiz for his comments regarding favoritism for Messi and Miami before the 2-1 loss. Messi, Suarez, Alba, and Tata approached referees regarding their officiating after the match, led to a confrontation between uh, Messi and friends and Monterey in the locker room area, confirmed by the Miami Herald and Deporte Total USA. Inter Miami declined to confirm or deny or comment on the matter. Ortiz shared his concern about rest making calls and games to favor Messi and Inter Miami during a sit down interview before the match. Quote on Tuesday, everything that surrounds Messi can lead to sporting and non sporting decisions. I'm concerned about the environment. Football is business. Business does not go the way of Monterey in a sit down interview. So Ortiz said that, and Messi and friends were not happy about it. Understandably so. Uh, gossip, rumor, and innuendo. We'll get into what to watch, where to watch it today. Remember, 4 o'clock this afternoon in Calhoun. Calhoun and the Wesleyan School on the network. Soccerdownhere.mixler.com. Thanks to our friends in Sonoraville last night, by the way. Great environment. Great to see everybody at the Furnace. That's a great nickname. And uh, Sonoraville ends up uh, losing to Calhoun on the boys' side, lost to Rome on the girls' side, but a great environment. And once again, thanks to uh, Jonathan Fuller and everybody at Sonorville for uh, rolling out the uh, the red carpet. And I mean that because it's that is their color. And uh, great to see everybody up there in Sonorville last night. So Calhoun, Wesleyan girls, 4 o'clock on the network, soccerdownhere.mixler.com. And we will have that one today for you. Then we'll pick business back up on Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, next week. And so. Uh, you've got, uh, high school today, 
You've got the uh, She Believes Cup tomorrow. Double headers there to go. Liverpool open discussions with Ruben Amorim to replace Jurgen Klopp. $12 million release clause. Barcelona have withdrawn their interest in Amorim. Manchester United have added Wolves English captain Max Kilman to their short list of defenders, also considering a summer move for Esri Consa from Aston Villa. Three Ds coming up later today, and I think that Drew is going to have to need the dump button, just to warn you. Joao Felix says that his international teammate, Manchester City midfielder Bernardo Silva, wants to move to Barca. Atalanta said they've not received any direct contact from Liverpool about midfielder Tan Koopminers. Liverpool want to sign Federico Valverde from Real Madrid. Bologna forward Joshua Xerxes wanted by United and Liverpool, but would prefer a move to AC Milan. Arsenal sent to rival Manchester United for the signing of Barcelona's 19-year-old center back, Mikael Fay. United have offered a new deal to 16-year-old English winger Bendito Montato amid interest from several clubs. Marco Silva has a release clause of 8.6 million pounds in his contract, could get interest from West Ham. That's the three-letter paper. Take the information at your own peril. Premier League clubs are pushing to scrap points deductions in favor of a luxury tax system. That's the four-letter paper. AC Milan have identified former Liverpool director of football Damian Camoli as the leading candidate to become their new chief exec. Ansu Fati faces an uncertain future at Barca following a disappointing loan spell at Brighton. Could be sold or sent out on loan again next year. And apparently Dame Helen Mirren supports Lecce. It came out in a, in a recent interview. So uh, if you want to uh, hang out with Dame Helen Mirren, Talk uh, Syria. Talk about Lecce. So you got that. Uh, what to watch, where to watch it today. And it is uh, soccer on the tube. BN and BN in Espanol. Liga on 3 o'clock. Lille and Marseille. And that's, uh, once again, BN and BN in Espanol on the simulcast. If you don't have all the BNs, Liga 1 Max, CDO for the fans, Teise, uh, Nuestra Tele, all those. And you can watch uh, Libertadores and Sudamericana as well. You can go to Fanatis, fntz.co slash soccer down here and get Fanatis and get addicted to all of those other places that you can watch uh, the sport of uh, soccer from. Jason got me hooked. I blame him. Season pass has uh, the U15 quarterfinals, Valencia and uh, Inter Miami is going on right now. Arsenal and Toronto FC's at noon. U17's quarters, it is at Galaxy and Sporting Kansas City at 2.30. And Flamingo and PSV at 5. Atlanta United's U15s got knocked out by Inter Miami yesterday. I think it was a 2-0 score. In the plus, championship, Rotherham United, Plymouth Argyle. That's a relegation six-pointer at 3 o'clock. Bundesliga, Frankfurt and Werder Bremen at 2.20. Tulsa and Phoenix tonight, USL Championship at 8.30. Paramount plus Copa de la Liga. Belisarius Field, Argentinos Juniors at 6. Serie A, Salernitana, Sassuolo at 2.45. So that's your activity there. Yes, Chelsea, Manchester United. Cole Palmer had a hat trick. I played him in fantasy. I got points. I didn't captain him, though. And that's why uh, Eric Ten Hag and Manchester United are going to be catching the wrath of Drew Dickinson in the 3D coming up a little later on. You mentioned the Premier League. And so since uh, Michael Head went down that road, we'll go down that road, talk about the matchups at the weekend. And it's going to be the three teams at the top. It's going to be Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester City all the way to the end with a handful of matches to go. Nothing's going to change, I don't think. But. Big uh, seven matches on Saturday, three on Sunday. Crystal Palace, Manchester City, Manchester City, big favorite. They're the early game at Selhurst Park, 10 o'clock. Villa, minus side hosting Brentford. Everton, minus side hosting Burnley. Fulham, plus 127 hosting Newcastle at a plus 197. Luton, a big underdog at Kenilworth Road to Bournemouth at a minus 108. Wolves hosting West Ham, both on the plus side. Wolves are favored. Brighton and Arsenal's the late game at 1230. And Arsenal's a minus 156 going to the Amex. Sunday, Manchester United, Liverpool at 12 at 1030. Liverpool favored at a minus 156. Sheffield United, who had a chance early on to hang with Liverpool and eventually did not, hosting Chelsea at a minus 233. Sheffield United is a plus 574. One o'clock on Sunday afternoon, Spurs and Forest. Spurs a minus 244. Nottingham Forest a plus 613. Standings in the Prem. Liverpool, 70 points, two points clear of Arsenal, three points clear of Manchester City. Villa, fourth at 59, Spurs at 57, that's it for Group A. Manchester United, 48 points in sixth, West Ham at 45. Manchester United, by the way, only has four points in their last five matches. West Ham at 45, Newcastle 44, Brighton 43, Chelsea 43, behind on goal difference and a match in hand. That gets us to Wolves, who are 11th at uh, 42, Bournemouth at 41. Bournemouth's won 405, by the way. They haven't lost in their last five. 
Fulham, 39 points. That's it for Group 2. Group 3, Crystal Palace at 30, Brentford at 28, Everton with a points deduction at 26, anticipating some more word on a possible second points deduction. Forrest, a points deduction there at 25. They are three points clear of Luton. Drop zone right now. Luton played 31. Burnley's played 31. They've got 19 points, six points from safety. Sheffield United, they've won three of 30. They've got 15 points on the year, and they are at a minus 52. They've given up 80 goals in 30 games this year. 80 goals in 30 games. Uh, 3D is uh, different. Uh, Drew comes in on Mondays at 1030 for Prem and Proper, the review. And uh, 3D is a different rant on the network. So you go to Spreaker.com, download the Spreaker app, do a search for soccer down here, set your notifications or however you get our podcast material, all of our tape stuff. Then you can listen there. So Drew's 3D, uh, he has already warned me. So uh, he's already warned me that he's going to need the dump button. So it's going to be explicit rating 3D later this afternoon with Drew Dickinson and uh, his thoughts on Manchester United. Uh, the way things are going in the EPL, Hutch says some team will have negative points by the end of the season. Might be. Uh, let's see. What else am I missing? Oh, headlines before we go. And I'm trying to blow through all of the headlines and everything there. Uh, so they've got, okay, they've got a guy doing CBS live shot, CBS New York, WCBS live shot inside Yankee Stadium. I guess they have a, uh, I guess they've got an afternoon game. And uh, so they got somebody there. Uh, Manchester United collapse against Chelsea, threatens Ten Hogs future. You will get more of that in the 3D. Um, Jurgen Klopp calls for an end to tragedy, chanting between Liverpool and Manchester United. Amen. Love that. And uh, I hope it happens, even though I know that it won't. Uh, also, let's see, other football news, trying to see if there's anything that's out there. And we talked about the comfort zone yesterday involving Chelsea and their players and Pochettino being concerned about that. So I think that covers Chelsea. Uh, let's see, Klopp and Ten Hag urge fans to avoid the tragedy chanting coming up on the weekend. Uh, yeah, this, this is something else I wanted to talk about. Sheikh Sar of Rio uh, Maya de Honda was given a two-match ban, sent off, sent off after going into the crowd to confront a fan. Spanish football, and this is from The Guardian, Spanish football's commitment to combating racism come under fire after the Fed handed a two-match ban to a goalkeeper who went into the stands to confront a man who had allegedly racially abused him. Accusations launched on Saturday as Rayo Mahada Honda took on Sestao River Club in a third-tier match in northern Spain. Keeper Cheikh Sar, born in Senegal, said he heard racial slurs being hurled at him. Wasn't the first time, but as he listened to an elderly man join others in allegedly making monkey gestures and attacking the color of his skin, it hit differently. Sar was quoted as saying other times it could be seen as something playful or a joke, however, this was not the case as it was something horrible, and I could not stop myself. It was a very sad and ugly thing they were saying. I grabbed him and asked why he was insulting me. My attitude was not aggressive. I just wanted to ask him why. Sar later apologized for what he described as an overreaction. Vinicius reached out on social media, back the keeper, says, may your bravery inspire others. Racists must be exposed, and matches cannot continue with them in the stands. Days later, the Spanish Football Federation said Sar would be handed a two-match ban for conduct contrary to good sportsmanship. Rayo Maha de Hondas would also forfeit the match, be deducted three points, and fined 3,006 euro. After the players abandoned the match in protest of the racial abuse. Jorge Casado, team captain, said he seems to be blamed for everything, meaning uh, Sar. Seems the offender gets off scot-free. Message seems to be that anything goes. Sestal fined 6,001 euro, ordered to play two matches behind closed doors with the Fed's disciplinary committee noting the club had failed to take measures to prevent racist incidents from occurring. Sestal described the decision as unfair and said it would appeal. So we set the, uh, we set the counter back to zero. Days from uh, stupidity. I'm not surprised. Speaking of Spurs, Joe Lewis spared jail time for his part in a brazen insider trading conspiracy, according to Edward Helmore at The Guardian. Fined $5 million, given three years probation by a New York judge. He's 87, heads the family that owns Spurs, faced as much as 45 years in prison if convicted at trial. But in a court filing, prosecutors said Lewis deserved leniency given his age, health issues, and the fact he'd voluntarily come to the U.S. to face punishment. 
Court fined his company $44 million, bringing the total fine and restitution to $49 million. Family have a net worth of $7.2 billion, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. So a fine for Joe Lewis. And let's see, scanning quickly, quickly. I think we're done there with the uh, Guardian. There was something in the Times I looked at. And if I could spell the Times, I could tell you what it was. Once again, reminder today, 4 o'clock, it is uh, our friends at Calhoun hosting the Wesleyan School. That's going to be our match, the one match at 4 o'clock. And uh, it's going to be on the network at soccerdownhere.mixler.com. Uh, let's see. Is there any, was there anything? Oh, yeah. Uh, Premier League is going to keep points deductions for major spending breaches. This is from uh, Martin Ziegler. So once again, when ziegler has got a byline at the Times, you got to pay attention. Premier League set to keep points deduction penalties for breaches of the financial rules, considering having a tariff that would impose only fines on clubs for lesser offenses. The new system, which would run alongside new squad cost rule that limits spending, would come into force for the 25-26 season if approved at the club's summer meetings in June. I do not anticipate that there will be a spending limits approval for Premier League clubs. But that's what uh, Martin Ziegler is posting this morning in the Times. Yes, and an OB is reminding us once again, Lipa FC on Big CBS on Saturday at 4 o'clock Eastern time, the Louisville-Indianapolis Proximity Association Football Contest. Lipa FC is uh, Lou, Lou City and Indy 11. That's on 4 o'clock. Remember, new theme music. And, uh, yes, Hutch, when $49 million is a rounding error. Yes. So uh, Orange and Black reminds us of that USL championship. Thanks for a hell of a show today. Thanks for putting up with me for a hell of a show. Uh, we were running around all over the place with this one. It was uh, Everton Moreira, the head coach of the U.S. Uh, men's national futsal team, as they get ready for the CONCACAF championship down in Nicaragua. They're flying down there Friday, week from uh, flying down there Sunday, week from um, Saturday is when the competition starts in Nicaragua. Thanks to Michael Parkers to be on goals. Thanks to John Pruch, the commissioner of NISA, to answer some questions about what's going on in the footprint. We got some answers. So we'll see how things go here involving uh, NISA and uh, Clovers and with uh, George FC. So we'll see what happens there. Get you ready for the weekend. Remember, noon tomorrow. It is uh, pregame, She Believes Cup. Jason and Jess on the call at 1230 on 92.9 The Game and the Odyssey app. That is a big blanking deal. Cannot wait to hear Jason and Jess on the call for the U.S. Women's National Team match for She Believes. The Atlanta United match with NYCFC is on Star 94. 630 air for pregame, 740 kick hour after with Abe and Garrett. You'll hear from Abe and maybe Garrett on Monday. And Monday will be a big day as well because we'll have the recap of She Believes with Bart. We'll have the recap of Atlanta United NYC. And there's a groundbreaking that's happening in uh, Fayetteville for the National Training Center. So uh, we'll be all around that as well. Catch up on Atlanta United, Drew Dickinson also for the 3D and everything going on there on your Monday. So very, very busy weekend. Be safe. Have fun. It's enjoy. Enjoy it all. Enjoy it all. It's going to be a very, very busy weekend, a fun weekend, and an important weekend here in Atlanta for a bunch of different reasons. So we'll talk about it again on Monday for all of us here at SDH. We made it through another week, folks, but the weekend's just getting started. Enjoy it all, and we'll catch up with you later today. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. We'll catch up with you Monday. We'll start it all over again. So for everybody here at SDH, I'm just John. Have a great weekend. Thanks to everybody all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast, from orange and black to uh, everybody here in the Southeastern footprint for being a part of things, to Harry in the mid, to Dell and Charleston, for all of our Atlanta listeners. Thanks for being a part of it, as you always are. Mucha plati, I'll play it safe. And since it is the end of the show, that means I get to do this. And we will be back at it again before you know it. Guaranteed that is the absolute truth. Finally found the outro to the show. Here we go. 